We're back on the road to Reykjavik with Bobby Fischer, and we've seen him perform brilliantly in the interzonal tournament, crushing the opposition there. And then he defeated Mark Taimanov in the quarterfinal candidates match 6 0. Then, incredibly, he repeated that feat by defeating Bent Larsen in the semi final, also 6 0. And that led to the final of the candidates and a match against the former world champion Tigran Petrosian, or as we say in West London, Tigran Petrosian. Now, Petrosian had uh, defeated Korchnoi to get to this final. Um, Petrosian, such a tough opponent. You know, he had this reputation of being invincible. You know, didn't lose many games at all. So this was already an incredible matchup with Fisher having won. Well, let me see the last seven games in the interzonal tournament, then six zero six zero in the the candidates matches. So that's already nineteen games in a row, winning. And he had to defeat the, or you know, he faced the rock of Petrosian in the final. Petrosian, 42 years old, Fisher, a fair bit younger, 28 years old. So that's an interesting factor. The final was played in Buenos Aires in the autumn of 1971. Well, I say the autumn, autumn for us, but of course it was springtime in the Southern Hemisphere. There was quite a bit of wrangling on where this match, match should take place. Yugoslavia had offered to host, which Fischer was in favour of, but um, Petrosian didn't want Yugoslavia. He never felt, he, he never had particularly good results there. Um, and in the end, FIDE basically decided that it should be Buenos Aires, that they'd, they'd uh, offered a decent prize fund. And in the end, well, yeah, FIDE basically plumped for the players, but Fischer was happy there. So, um, let's crack on with the very first game. Fisher with the white pieces. And this was a repeat of an opening that was played in the fischer Taimanov match. Petrosian selected the Taimanov variation and Fisher repeated the line that he had played against Taimanov in a couple of games. So this looks quite like um, a Sveshnikov variation, actually. Um, so in game two of that fischer timonov match, Timonov played Queen A5 check and lost a long game. Here Petrosian plays Bishop B6, which was the continuation of game six of the fischer timonov match. And now it really does look like a Sveshnikov variation. Now here's the first key moment in the game. So in that game six match, Fischer Taimonov, Taimonov played knight d4 and lost there. It was a close game and, and the opening probably wasn't bad for black at all. But here Petrosian played the dynamic move d5 and he relates a very interesting story. Uh, by the way, I'm taking as my main source for a lot of these uh, stories around the game, this book, which I've mentioned before, Russians versus Fisher, a very, very interesting book featuring archive material from uh, the Soviet Union and also you know, annotations from Soviet journals as well. So D5 played here. And Petrosian wrote, after the conclusion of the Korchnoi Petrosian match, I was handed a sealed envelope addressed to the winner of the match. I like the way he talks in the third person, it's quite funny. Anyway, he continues. It contained an analysis of the opening of the first game in the Fisher Taimanov match, an instructor in the Kishinev chess club, V. Chebanenko, who had the rating of a candidate master had found 
this move d5 and given some analysis to a Petrosian. So this is very, I find this very interesting. This uh, candidate master, uh, Chebanenko, well, he became famous as a coach much later on. Um, I mean, a legendary coach, actually, for the, the Moldovan chess school, for example, uh, Victor Bologan was one of his pupils, but, but many other players. But not only that, Chebanenko uh, was the originator of many opening systems. Uh, for example, the most famous one is this so-called Chebanenko variation of the Slav with A6 that goes like this. And this, well, became famous at the highest levels in, 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 in world chess. So interesting that Chebanenko, I love this kind of intrigue, the sealed envelope. He gave some analysis to Petrosian. And in fact, the game followed Chebanenko's analysis. So this pawn was taken and this allows the bishop to come out. Now there looks like there, there's a problem for black here. But queen a5, now if that bishop is taken then queen takes knight is fatal for white. So queen d2, castles, so black is using this pin here. Fisher develops and also protects that pawn. And rook g8 was found by Chabinenko. And now, if white castles, then bishop h3 is a very annoying pin for white. So Fischer played rook d1. Now, Petrosian writes again. We played the opening moves quickly. After d5, this pawn sacrifice, Fischer instantly captured the pawn at d5. He paused for thought only after castles queenside, became nervous and red spots appeared on his face. At that moment, the lights went out. Power cut <laughs> in the theater. The only light came from lamps in the side passages and from somewhere in the back. The board was of course visible, but not for normal play. I got up. The, the arbiter stopped Fisher's clock, but he remained seated, staring at the position. Five minutes passed, then ten. I asked the interpreter over and he called the chief arbiter. I pointed out that Fisher ought to have left the table. But my opponent, the Fisher who had always paid so much attention to the lighting, suddenly agreed to having his clock switched on and continued to sit at the table in semi-darkness. So that's a, a fantastic anecdote from Petrosian. And maybe that's that unfortunate break when the lights went out in the theatre, maybe that helped Fisher to calm his nerves a little bit. In any case, it's Petrosian, uh, at this point, after rook d1, it's Petrosian's move. And rook takes g2 was the move that Chabonenko had actually recommended in this secret analysis. Um, but for some reason, Petrosian didn't play this. In fact, well, after knight e4, it's probably not so bad for white. Um, white can survive this position. And, well, after this, it's not so bad. But black certainly has the upper hand. But Petrosian played instead bishop f5. And after this move, well, Fischer started to find his feet. Petrosian said afterwards that he thought e4 was more challenging. Uh, in fact, it, white is okay in this position. It, in fact, it's not so bad. So after bishop d3, bishop takes and knight d4. I mean, this is still actually quite a pleasant position for black. But... White's king reaches safety. That's already reassuring. Of course, black would like to take here and give a knight fork a check. The problem is that after queen takes, queen takes queen is check. Black doesn't have time to play that knight fork. So king b8 played. And now, of course, 
queen takes c3 is a threat, but Fischer nudged to the side, very coolly played. Queen takes pawn and now f4, and Fischer is fighting back here because there can be a threat to exchange pawns in the middle and take here. So this is not so bad. Rook c8, good move from Petrosian with pressure down here. So, well, by force, they're reaching an end game. Um, and it seems a little bit double-edged. You know, Black is threatening here, but actually Fisher is fine. And again, there is a threat to exchange here and take on f7. And Petrosian finds a very good move here. Pawn to f5, which looks kind of crazy because it gives up this pawn, but actually Black is able to recapture this pawn here. Um, if knight c4, then b5. So Fisher hangs on to that pawn for the moment. And knight here, and the knight comes back again. So if Fisher wants a draw, he can simply bring the rook back, and black has to repeat moves. But Fisher goes for more, absolutely typically. While there's a chance to try and squeeze something from the position, he does so. And again, rook e2 would be a draw, but Fisher swings the rook over, allows that pawn to be captured. Checkmate is threatened here, so knight f3. Now we have a, a big exchange of pawns. But I find it interesting that you know Fisher is wants to go for this. And h4, so gives his king an escape square. And rook takes f7. Okay, we can kind of take stock of this position. Huge exchange of pawns. It's still equal material. Three pawns each. This h-pawn has some potential, of course. However, black's pieces are very well situated. Very active rook and knight that gives counterplay against the king. In particular, I really like this knight guarding the pawn, looking at this crucial g4 square. Black must be okay here. In fact, well, Petrosian played rook d1, which is not bad. Um, a5 is a good move, which prepares counterplay. At some point, this pawn will be taken. Uh, and it's actually very difficult for white to advance this h-pawn. Let me just show you this. So if h5, then the rook comes back. So preventing the pawn advancing. And if rook here, then knight g4. And you can see white's king not particularly well placed here at all. You know, there's at some points, you know, this this is going to be annoying as well. So if we come back to a5, then what about king h2? Well, then we can go pawn grabbing. And again, there's a problem with advancing the pawn because of knight g4 check, this beautiful knight, wonderfully centralized. And black gets counterplay like this with the rook coming behind here. And a4, well, this line goes much deeper, but basically black has sufficient counterplay with this a-pawn. So let's go right back here. a5 would be a sensible move. Rook d1 check was played instead, also reasonable for black. And rook a1, so grabbing this pawn straight away. I can imagine that Petrosian was in time pressure at this moment because he blundered. He made a clear blunder in this position. In fact, he's still okay if he takes his pawn. It starts to get a bit tricky. Knight h4 guards this pawn and wants to keep pushing the pawn. But rook a5 is a good move. If the king comes up, then f4 check, followed by rook takes pawn. So the king has to come here first. Of course, if h6, then again, we've got this knight fork, very important, 
a check and then we can take the pawn. So you can see that Fischer has to fiddle around with his king first. So king h3, king a7, that just gets the king off the back rank. Tactically, that's important. h7, and now we check from behind and check here. And this, well, it's a long sequence, but basically this is going to end up as a draw like this. Now, it's a long way to see, but um, basically, if Petrosian had been consistent in taking this pawn, he would have had sufficient counterplay. But it's a tricky variation. He played f4. It, it's hard to know what he overlooked in this variation. Fischer took this. I mean, maybe he imagined he was somehow gaining a tempo here. I, I don't know. But Fischer finds a beautiful move here. Um, it's a really subtle move that basically kills the game completely. Rook e4. So instead of pushing the pawn straight away, he basically sorts out black's pieces and makes sure black's pieces are just in terrible positions. Um, I mean, really, black is just lost here, actually. You know, if the knight goes back, then it's going to be pushed away again uh, by the rook. Um, Petrosian took on g2 and king g3. This is very nice. The knight is completely dominated, has no good square to go to. By the way, if rook takes g2, then the, the knight is loose, the rook is loose. It's difficult to stop the pawn. Basically, white is just winning that position. So anyway, knight takes g2. King g3, you can see that knight is in a terrible situation. All these squares are controlled by white pieces. And it's just impossible for Petrosian to defend this. After rook a5, of course, he didn't take this because then rook takes pawn. But knight e5 shuts the rook out, leaves the knight still trapped in this position and the rook's pawn is rolling on and here Petrosian resigned. The head of the Soviet delegation was Viktor Baturinsky, a, um, a, a Soviet prosecutor, so they were a political appointment basically, but he writes that when Petrosian resigned in the first game there was loud and prolonged applause we too stood there during those unpleasant minutes, feeling a sense of chagrin and bitterness, not only over the loss of the game, but also over the wasted, fine opening innovation and the missed opportunities to draw in the end games. Oh, sad words from Baturinsky there. So that meant that Fischer had won 20 games on the trot, 20 high-level classical games on the trot, an extraordinary record. He must have seemed invincible. What could they do to stop him? Even after Petrosian had caught him in the opening, Fischer had clawed his way back and won this endgame with some very fine technique. Well, watch out for more videos coming soon. I'm going to show you all the games from this candidate's final match. But that was an extraordinary start to the match. Thanks for watching.